Have you experienced one of those one-way video interviews during a recent job search? That's where you have to record yourself on camera answering questions that the employer has prepared for you. That can be a little intimidating. That can be a little stressful. Speaking into your laptop camera, pretending that you're speaking to a human being, knowing it's being recorded and going to be reviewed later. I'm going to talk about that in this episode. I'm Larry Cornett, and this is Invincible Career. So if you go to newsletter.invinciblecareer.com, this is issue 584, preparing for an initial job interview. And that seems to be what's happening more these days is you're not necessarily having a screening interview with a recruiter or the hiring manager. You are speaking into the camera to no one. (laughs) Uh, there's a platform called spark hire that does this and it's essentially a one way video interview. The employer can put together a series of questions they'd like you to answer. Uh, it can be text. They could also record a video of themselves asking the question. And then you have a little bit of time to prepare to answer. They can set that time. So it could be like, oh, you have a minute to think about this or two or three minutes. And then you get to record your response. Some let you do multiple takes. Some just let you do one take. And so, yeah, you're on camera speaking into the the webcam, trying to answer these questions. And that's it's a little stressful because with a human being, at least you're getting some give and take. Like... Are they understanding what I'm saying? Uh, Does my answer make sense? They could say, oh, what do you mean by that? And you could clarify something. You can't do that with a video interview. So I think a lot of the companies are using this to get a lot more in kind of inflow for their top of funnel recruiting. A lot easier to ask hundreds of people to do these quick video interviews and then they can quickly scan through them and say, nope, 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 maybe, yeah, and then take you to the next interview. Um, Yeah, these weren't being done when I was still looking for jobs back in the old days, Uh, but I never did this process anyway. I've talked about this a million times. I always networked my way in and had an inside champion or somebody that brought me in, so I never would have had to apply cold like this. Um, thank goodness. Um, my son was recently preparing for one of these. So I was talking with him about it and he told me all about the platform and given what I do for a living, I said, well, let's spend a little bit of time and I'll give you some, uh, career coaching, some job search coaching and get you ready for this. And so I, I decided to focus on kind of three main strategies to make sure he was ready for the, for the interview. And there's more coming obviously, but this was that initial interview. Um, one strategy was deeply analyzing the job description. So really going through it with a fine tooth comb and being prepared to address what they're looking for. Number two was talking with current and past employees. I've talked about this before. Super helpful in this case. And number three was, how do you prepare for this new type of interview? So this isn't your traditional phone interview or Zoom interview or in-person interview. Very different. Um, And so there's a little bit of that that comes into play. So first, let's talk about that job description. So I think most people know to kind of do this, but they don't really do it in the detail that I believe you should. So people will look at the job description. They'll see what they're looking for, the key responsibilities, the qualifications, um, things that might be nice to have, things that they're looking for, you know, bullet, kind of a bullet list. And we're used to the usual, you know, I want you to have five years of experience. You have to have a degree in this field. We want people that have worked in this type of industry, you name it, that kind of stuff. 
And so people will kind of look through that and say, yeah, this looks like something that I think I'm qualified for. Um, I'm going to go ahead and go for it. I'm going to apply. And that's, that's about as far as they take it. And then they start doing other types of preparation, but it's actually a kind of a gold mine, um, of information that you can use to deeply prepare for this interview. First thing to remember, this is a bit of a wish list. When a hiring manager puts together a job description and they're going to post that, this is something that would be a dream candidate that would 100% match every single thing that they want. They know they're rarely going to get that. And so they're kind of looking for a partial fit. Who knows? You know, it depends on the hiring manager if they're looking for a 90% fit or a 70%. My guess is if it drops below 60, 70%, they're probably like, yeah, you're not really qualified for this. But don't feel like when you look through this job description that you have to knock it out of the park for every single bullet point that they have in it. You know, you don't have to. But you should be ready to talk about it. And that's where I think the the important difference is in how people prepare for these interviews. They'll see something like, oh, I don't have five years of experience. And that's as far as they go. It's like, okay, <laughs> how are you going to address that? How are you going to close that gap? How are you going to overcome that objection that they might have? So, you know, I pulled up a recent job description I just found on LinkedIn jobs, uh, for a user experience researcher. I'm not going to name the company, but there are lots of little nuggets of information that are sprinkled throughout this job description. You know, when they talk about who are we looking for, you know, who are the people we're looking for? And right away they talk about this being a pivotal role where you have to strike a balance between really detailed hands-on, they call it micro research and usability evaluations, but also balancing that with leading strategic initiatives that shape vision across this product. And they want you to be independent and proactive, you know, an independent and proactive leader. So this is that whole player coach thing that many companies are looking for now. They want somebody who can get their hands dirty, roll up their sleeves, you know, and dive in and get into the details and do a lot of hands-on individual contributor work, IC work. At the same time, you got to be strategic. And that's hard. That is hard. Um, Because you often get overwhelmed with the workload of all the hands-on work that needs to be done. And then they're going to be complaining, you're not being strategic enough. Where's all the cool strategy we are expecting from you? Or vice versa, somebody who's really strategic and they're doing a lot of this strategy work and vision work, but they're dropping the ball on the hands-on work. They're like, you're getting behind schedule on your projects. So just be aware of that. If you see something like that, that this is a player coach role, it's hard. And you need to be very clear during the interview with questions and probing to get answers about this. of What is that balance? How is it possible to do both? You know, what are their expectations? What balance should you have? Is it 70% hands-on, 30% strategy, 90, 10? I don't know. That's something you really have to figure out. So already that's a little nugget of information that's telling you what you're getting into. And it's also telling you, what do they want to hear from you when they're talking with you? They want to hear that you still know how to do the hands-on work but you've also done stuff that's very strategic, that you've done stuff that looks like leadership, that you've been able to work independently without a lot of guidance. So you better be giving examples, those hero stories I talk about, where you've done both. It can be a project where you're like, yeah, it was a, we were short staff, so I had to roll up my sleeves and get really hands-on with this project. I had to do the work myself. And then another project that's like, in this case, there were more junior people on the project and I was able to lead and be more strategic and set the vision for it and sell it to the executive. So be sure you have examples of both or what they're going to hear is you only do IC work. You can't do strategy. You can't be a leader. I'm not hearing that. Or it sounds like you really only want to do strategy work that you don't know how to do hands-on work anymore. And that will sink you in the interview. 
So already you see something that's telling you you better have stories from both of those worlds. So then it goes into the details of the key responsibilities. And it's talking about developing and implementing a research strategy that aligns with organizational goals, product roadmaps. So there you go. It's talking about collaboration, communication, alignment with the organization and what it's trying to achieve, being able to develop that roadmap and then execute it. It said implement. So have a story for each one of these. And that's what I mean by going through with a fine tooth comb. Go through, look at each bullet item. And I I told my son, I said, paste all this into a column in a spreadsheet. So each bullet, responsibility, expectation, requirement, you name it, was in its own row in a column in a spreadsheet. And then in the column next to it, explain how you have experience doing that. And so what you're going to find when you're doing this is you either kind of exceed that expectation like, oh yeah, I've done this a million times. I've done something even harder than this. I have a great example, always have an example. And so make a note just make a few notes, you know, a few bullet point notes and say, okay, yep, I've done that. Here's the story I'm going to share. It's project X at company Y. That's when I did that. Or it's going to be maybe a little bit lower. Like, yeah, I kind of have done that. You know, I, I I wouldn't say I knocked it out of the park, but I have some experience with that. And so you have that story and you have to be confident. I was telling my son that it really is an interesting balance of confidence and humility. Because if you're going in being fully humble and saying, oh, I'm not good enough for this job and I don't have all the experience you want and I'm missing a bunch of skills. If you're acting like that, you're already going to probably get passed over. But if you're overconfident and you're acting like you know everything and you have all the answers and you've done everything when you actually haven't, they're going to be able to push through that and see that you're stretching the truth or you're being overconfident. And so it is a balance. It's this confident humility of saying, I fit a lot of the requirements. I've got some great stories. I know I can do these things. These other things I haven't done yet, but I'm a fast learner and I'm probably going to be one of the hardest working people you've ever hired. I get up to speed quickly. I, you can talk with my past managers and you can hear the stories of how I've done that. And I will learn. And if you've actually, before you even come into this interview, researched that very requirement so that you learned more about it, then you can talk about it. You could say, I'm already starting to research the EPA regulations and the guidelines for testing and this and that. And I'm ready to talk about it. You know, I haven't had hands-on experience with it, but I'm learning it already because I know it's important here. That's really going to impress them that you cared so much about the interview that you started researching how to do the job, right? And then there's going to be cases where you haven't done exactly that, but you have something that is related, that's similar enough that it's a proxy for it. And that's where a lot of people kind of stop. They're like, oh, I haven't done that. But if you push and you ask the questions like I was doing with my son and I do with my clients, I'm like, well, tell me about a project where you did this or did that. Or it's like, didn't you work on this? And I'm like, yeah. And I said, that's, that's kind of the same. And in a good example, I remember somebody was saying, oh, they wanted somebody who had managed a small team and they hadn't officially been the HR manager for, for a small team. They didn't have people directly reporting to them in the system. But I knew they had led a group of like five interns for the summer. So they took control of that and they gave them projects. They reviewed their work. They coached and mentored them, even though they weren't their full-time employees. And I said, that's management, that's leadership. So when you would talk about that, you'd say, you know, I don't have a team reporting to me right now. However, I was responsible for the summer internship program. So I had five college students who came in and worked for us for three months. I gave them their work. I reviewed, I mentored, I coached everything you would do with an employee. So I have management experience. I've done this. I've been a leader. 
even though I don't have a team reporting to me right now. So you want to make sure that if you have done something that's a bit of a proxy, you explain that. Don't just let the ball drop and say, oh, I haven't done that, or I don't have that experience. If you have something similar, if you can show them the bridge between what they're expecting and what you've done and see that it's related enough and they can extend that and say, oh, okay, I could see where they could be good at this. I could see where they could learn how to do this. And then there's going to be the stuff where you just simply don't have it at all. And you may not even have a proxy for it. So that's when you have to have this confident humility where you're like, yeah, I saw that requirement. I haven't worked with that. I don't actually have experience with that yet. But I started researching it and I started learning about it. And here's what I learned. And I'm confident that I can get up to speed. Like I said, I'm a fast learner and I want this job and I'm going to work hard and I will learn how to do that. You know, I did that for a job way back when, um, I remember I had no experience with, um, kind of enterprise software and hardware systems. I'd been working at Apple on consumer stuff and there was all this stuff they were going to be doing with network systems, storage attached network, um, network attached storage. So SANS and NASs and all that kind of stuff and storage subsystems and RAID systems, which I knew nothing about, but I knew that the job was all about that. So I went out that weekend, I bought like five books on all this stuff on server architecture and network architecture, raid systems. And I read them cover to cover over the weekend. So when I went in for the interview, they said, Oh, you've only worked on consumer software. And I said, yes, that's true. However, I've been learning everything I can about raid, NAS, SAN, and I understand. And they quizzed me a little bit. Okay, what's a RAID 5? What's a RAID 2? Why would you use a RAID 3? Whatever it might be, right? Why would you use RAID 1 and do mirroring? What's a RAID 0? Uh, what are the benefits? What are the pros and cons? You know, sometimes it's faster for read, but slower for writing. Some has better failover, but it's more expensive in terms of the disk that you have to use. All that kind of stuff. So I knew enough I always talk about this, learn enough to be dangerous. (laughs) You don't have to be the expert. You can be the expert over time. Learn enough to be dangerous. So I was able to talk the talk enough that they're like, you know quite a bit about this. I don't think it's gonna be a problem for you to pick it up. And so I got hired. I got the job. So you can do that. You can do that. Um, Yeah, coming back to this job description. So they've kind of got loaded up some of these bullets. So some of these bullet points, actually, you would break into multiple Um, where they're, they're kind of putting a whole bunch of stuff in one requirement, but they're talking about hands-on micro level usability research. So that's telling you, you're going to be doing a lot of hands-on work. Uh, recognizing the smallest detail can have big impact on user experience. So what's that telling you? They're going to want to hear that you have attention to detail, that you don't drop the ball. So in the column next to this, explain how you've done hands-on usability research and an example of where you have really tight attention to detail, right? So when they're saying, you know, how, how much do you pay to the details when you're doing this research and all of a sudden you're like, actually, yeah, I have a good example of that. And so you share that story. And then they're talking about sophisticated cross-functional research that's going across multiple products and platforms and it's being consistent, coherent in the experience. So that's where you have to talk about your ability to collaborate, to work with other teams, to work at a higher level. So this was the first bullet, this micro level detail. Now they're saying we want stuff that spans multiple products and platforms. So you have to go up a level and say, okay, where's an example of research that you've done that did work at that level that you had to collaborate. You had to talk with people on other teams, be ready to share that. And then the next one, they're talking about vision, you know, collaborating with leadership and product teams to craft a long-term mission and a tactical plan. So they want both, right? This is that player coach thing again, being able to work on a mission and then say, okay, now what's the actual plan? What's the roadmap? Being an advocate. So this is somebody who's confident that speaks up as proactive 
And they talk about fostering a culture that prioritizes customer understanding and the needs of a diverse user base. So again, this is a, this is a hint at what they're looking for. Are you somebody that just sits behind your screen and does your work and doesn't talk to anybody? Or do you stand up and play the role of an advocate and speak up and proactively educate people in the company about stuff? Give an example of that. So that's, this is what I mean is like, go through this thing bullet by bullet by bullet and right next to each bullet give an example of when you've done that how you could answer that to say yeah i'm comfortable with that yes i have experience with that or here's something i've done that's similar to that then later they're talking about exceptional leadership skills positive relationships with collaborators even executive leadership so again have a story about that Decision making at the highest levels. Yeah. So they're looking for somebody that knows how to handle executives, which is different. And I think anybody who's done this knows that collaborating with peers and even across different organizations or even up a level to your manager and so forth is different than dealing with executives. It's a whole different ball of wax. The way that you have to communicate with them, the level of detail they want, how you speak the language of what they care about. That's what they're looking for. So be ready with examples of that. Then they're talking about storytelling and communication. So showing that you're an excellent communicator, showing that you can be persuasive, that you can put a story together, that you can influence and inspire. And then they go into all the qualifications. I'm not going to read through all these, but I think you get the point. So whatever it is that you're applying for, take that job description, put all those details, all the requirements, the qualifications, they have nice to haves, and put that into a column in a spreadsheet and right next to it, explain exactly what you've done or an example of how you've done this in a project or whatever it might be that shows you check that box. Do you check that box fully? Exceptionally check that box? Do you kind of check that box? You know, it's not your strongest, but yeah, you're, you can learn. Is it kind of a proxy for checking that box? Explain why, build the bridge for it. Or is it not check that box? And now you have to figure out, do I close that gap now? Is there a way for me to close that gap to gain that understanding? Can I do some programming in a new language that I'm not familiar with over the weekend so I can at least talk intelligently about it? Or do you want to explain, yeah, I will learn how to do that. I am a strong learner. I love to learn. I'm a lifelong learner. I'm fast. I work hard. It's not going to be a problem. I've had some people I've worked with that I've said, be super confident about it. Because here's the, here's the situation. You can say, I know I can do that. I know in the first 90 days on a job, I will be up to speed I will be effective. I will learn how to do all this and you'll be happy you hired me. And if you're not, you can fire me and mean it because if you can't do the job, if you're failing at it, do you really want to be in that job anyway? uh, Besides, they're not going to keep you. (laughs) So it's like, be confident about it. It's almost like placing a bet on yourself. Why would you not bet on yourself? Tell them, I can do this. I know I can learn this. I will be effective. I will be productive. I will be successful. And if I'm not, fire me. I'm okay with that. I wouldn't want to be here anyway if I can't do what you need me to do. That's confident. At the same time, it's humble. You're not saying, I will know everything on day one. You're saying you're going to learn. You're saying you're going to work hard. I think they can respect that. Okay. That's about all I want to say about the job description, but it is super helpful to do that. Very effective thing to do is strategy number two, talking with current and past employees. So my son was able to find somebody who does exactly the job that he was applying for, not in the same company, but in a company that was almost identical in the same industry, doing the same kind of work, whatever it might be. Uh, same geography even. So he talked with him. He got some advice. And 
this guy was super helpful. He said, here are the things they're going to want to ask you in this first interview. Here are their hot button issues. You know, some of these, I won't say it's a trick question, but it's a question that if you answer it this way, they're going to be like, yeah, I don't think you're going to be right for this job. But if you answer it this way, they're going to say, cool, this seems like it's going to work out. And some of these are hot button issues, depending on the industry the company's in, depending on what they do. You know, some people, for example, might be really against behavioral targeting with uh, advertising companies. And so you're interviewing with an advertising company that does behavioral targeting. They're going to say, well, how do you feel about us harvesting data and targeting people with personalized ads? And if you say, yeah, I think it's kind of creepy. I don't think companies should be doing that. (laughs) Guess what? They're going to say, yep, I think this interview's done. That's what we do. You're not going to fit in here. You're not going to like this job if you have a moral, you know, opposition to this. So you got to think about that. And so it was really helpful to get that kind of information. So he said, yeah, here's the stuff they're going to ask. Here's most likely what they're looking for. Here are their hot button issues, the things that they care about, things that they get worried about if they see it in the candidate. Here's what the job's like. Here are the kind of things I was talking with them about. All very helpful. So that was, that was a current employee, very helpful. The cool thing was my son did some digging and research and we found so much information. You know, it doesn't take a ton of time, but we found a lot of information. And he found a past employee who had created a video of a day in the life. So they said, yeah, I want to take you through a day in the life of this type of job. And they went through from like morning to quitting time of what it was like to do the job. The equipment they used, the projects they were working on, the people they worked with, expectations, outcomes, all that kind of stuff. Wow. Talk about helpful. That's like shadowing an employee. And so immediately my son felt really educated about what the job is, what was expected, what it would be like to work there. You'd be surprised at how much of this information is online now. And if you can't find it, Look for people. I've told people, sometimes current employees will give you information. Sometimes they won't. Sometimes they don't want to bias the interview process. Sometimes they don't feel comfortable. And they don't want you telling somebody later. It's like, yeah, Bob told me it's really crappy to work here. And and it was going to be really stressful, but it doesn't seem too bad. It's like, wow, you just hung Bob out to dry. So yeah, sometimes people don't want to talk. Past employees are more likely to talk to you. Past employees are more likely to be honest about it. I've done that for every job. My friends do that for every job. They want to talk with people who have worked for that manager before, have worked in that team before, know the company inside, what the culture is really like, what the truth is about the project process and everything they do, what they reward, what they don't reward. Because it is this dance that the company does of trying to be nice and impress you, especially if they want to hire you. So they're putting their best foot forward. They're not going to tell you all the dirty laundry that's inside the company, but a past employee will. So I have done that. Super helpful. So you can go on LinkedIn and you can look for past employees of that company, people in that job description, that job title. And say, okay, if I'm going in as a design leader into this company, who are the past design leaders for that group? Well, looky there. I found them. (laughs) I'm going to offer to buy them lunch. I'm going to buy them coffee. I'm going to have a chat and say, what can you tell me about it? I really want to understand the culture. What's important to them? What's it like working for that team? What was that manager like? What do they value? How do they decide who to promote? You know? What will make me successful in this role? Is there anything you wish you had known? Is there anything that's a gotcha? I had some people tell me some gotchas. You know, they said, hey, watch out for this person. They're going to act really friendly in that first week when you meet them. Like they're your best friend, but they're not. And later they're going to turn some stuff against you. So kind of nice to know, because if you go in cold, you had no idea. You had no idea who these people are their personalities. So yeah, strategy number two is powerful. 
talk with current and past employees. And then finally, just wrap it up, preparing for this specific type of interview. So this is different, right? Very different recording and talking and no one on the screen. <laughs> it's very weird. And I, I tell people it is so much easier to answer questions smoothly and confidently and to speak well, especially if you only get one take. If they only let you record one answer and you don't get a chance to do it again. Shouldn't you rehearse? Shouldn't you practice? And so one of the good things to do is to go through, like I just said, go through that job description and now you have your notes. What am I going to talk about? If they say, tell me about a time that you've had really strong attention to detail in a project. Tell me about a time you had to push back on executives. Tell me about a time that you were strategic and you created a vision for your product, for your team. Now you have the examples and it will come to mind quickly. You could even have your notes up on the screen. So you could have your notes up side by side with the window where you're being recorded and you could glance at the bullets and you can quickly scroll through it. Practice doing that so you look natural. I mean, that's kind of a nice thing about this is you could have notes handy. Having your hero stories ready, having your story when they say, tell me about yourself. Well, what are you going to say? You don't want to talk for 15 minutes about your life story. I was born in Ohio and I went to school and then I was a great athlete and I did this and then I went to college. That's not what they're looking for. So you got to get your whole elevator pitch. Tell me about yourself story tight. You got to get it tight so you can quickly go through the narrative of your story, your career, why you're a great fit for this role, why you're excited to be talking to them. You know, that whole thing of wrapping up and it's like, and that's why I'm here today. Everything I've done has led up to this where I feel like I'm a great fit for this role. I'm excited to talk to you, with you about it. So rehearse it, practice it. Get ready to answer those questions that could throw you for a loop when someone says, what's a bad thing your past manager would have said about you? What's a, what's a thing that your manager would say you're really good at doing? Tell me about a time that you had an argument with a coworker and you resolved it. How'd you work through that? Have all these stories ready. And so they can come to mind very quickly because then you get to be really smooth during this video interview process. And I would recommend structure an example. And if you've talked with people, guess what? This current employee said, here's the questions that are going to be asked. Past employees, they talked about it too. Here's what that initial video interview was like. Here's what they asked me. Structure it so that you will have the question. You can answer it. Record yourself on video. I watched a few of these and the people looked so nervous and uncomfortable. They did not look confident at all. They weren't smiling. Their eyes were darting all over the place. And that does not work well for an interview. And I know that this should not matter. I know it shouldn't. I'm an introvert. I don't like talking with people. I, you know, I've in the past struggled with eye contact. I've had to work on it. Shouldn't matter, but it does. I'm sorry. And it still does. So record yourself, use your laptop to do this and pretend you're being asked these questions and then answer them or have a friend do it or your partner do it or whoever, and then tell your story. And you'll notice as you do this, you're like, Oh, I fumbled. I sounded really silly when I said that, or I keep mispronouncing that word or whatever it might be. Rewrite your notes. I've done that when I'm doing public speaking. I'm like, why do I keep tripping up over that word? I, I don't get it. Fine. I'll just pick a different word. I'm not going to keep doing this. And I will rewrite what I'm going to say. And then I rehearse it again. And I keep practicing until I don't even have to look at the notes. And so I can say, oh yeah, tell me about yourself. Okay. And then you have your story and you tell the person about yourself. Tell me about why you want to leave your current job. Why are you interviewing with us? Why do you want this job? Be ready. And so you do that. Watch it. Pay attention to your body language. Are you smiling? Are you making good eye contact? Do you look confident? Do you look happy? Do you look like you're excited to be there? Or do you look like you're afraid? Or bored? Or whatever. That helps too. So that will help you prepare. And then test the equipment. Test the software. Usually there's ways for you to do this. 
I think Sparkar has this where you can try it out. Try it out. You'd be surprised, and we all have experiences with many, many Zoom meetings where people have their microphone set to the wrong microphone. It's like, oh, no, it's on my laptop microphone instead of my headphones, and it sounds horrible. Or the sound's not coming out of your speakers. It's like, what's going on? There's no sound. (laughs) Stuff always messes up. So try the software, practice, be ready to adjust your settings, do a check of the equipment. Do I sound good? Does the microphone sound good? What's behind me in camera? I don't know why people do this, but they've had really weird, strange stuff behind them on camera that they really shouldn't have in a a video interview. So check your background. Make sure it looks okay. Make sure your lighting's good. If they're trying to interview you and see you and it's a dark room and they can't even see you on camera, it's not going to go well. Or if the lighting's too harsh and you look like you're in an interrogation room being interrogated by police, that's not going to look so good either. (laughs) So try it out. Practice. Use the equipment. Use the software. Get familiar with it. When it's time to record, you can make sure you're ready, make sure it goes really well, and crush it, right? Crush it. All this preparation is good, because a lot of these questions are going to be the same kind of questions that any employer is going to ask you. So being prepared, working on it, It won't be throwaway work. It'll help you get ready for other interviews too. Okay. Well, I hope that helps. I hope that helps you with this new type of interview. And if you have any other tips or suggestions for folks, go to newsletter.invinciblecareer.com. This is preparing for an initial job interview, issue 584. You can leave a comment. Uh, Oh, by the way, if you go to this, you're going to see a link to check out something I've recently launched which is an introductory coaching call. You can talk with me for 30 minutes, get 30 minutes of coaching for just $20. And there's an initial questionnaire I have you fill out so I can be prepared for the call. So it's not like I get on the call and go, who are you? What do you want? It's You're going to tell me what you're looking for. I'm going to have your LinkedIn. I'm going to be able to look at it and try to help you as much as I can in 30 minutes. That's what I do with these calls is I try to help you as much as I can. I'm not going to hard sell you on another call. That's up to you. You know, it's totally up to you. Uh, And this is only available for this initial call. It's a one-time initial call, 30 minutes for $20. So check it out. There's a link to check it out. All right. Good luck with your next interview. Until next time, I wish you the best of luck in becoming an opportunity magnet for the best things in life.